and welcome to the lecture for research methods. We'll be talking about uh, some of the threats to internal validity. Uh, so first, a quick review about what internal validity is, and it's really just about confidence. It's the confidence you have uh, in a cause-effect relationship after uh, doing an experiment. Right? You say, okay, I think the independent variable had an effect on the dependent variable. And if your uh, study has good uh, internal validity, then you can be confident that, that, that you're right that the IV did uh, affect the DV, that whatever difference you find in the DV is attributable, is due to, caused by the independent variable. Right? So for, you, for that to happen, for you to have that confidence, a couple things have to happen. Obviously, you have to have a, a observable, measurable, reliable difference in the dependent variable, which is where uh, a lot of times our statistics come in, because uh, even if the IV didn't have an effect, we might could expect uh, some difference between uh, groups and the dependent variable. So we use statistics to say, well, how big does the difference have to be to say it's not just due to random error, right? But So we have this kind of statistically significant difference, at least uh, a difference, a big, observable, reliable difference. That's got to be there, right? Uh, and you want um, that difference not to be there uh, uh, before the independent variable is introduced, right? That the only way you can say that something uh, one thing caused another thing is for it to precede it in time as this temporal relationship that there can't be a pre-existing difference on the dependent variable between groups uh, before uh, you uh, manipulate the dependent variable, before you do something to them. Right? So the IV has to precede the DV uh, and then you have to eliminate extraneous factors. And we talked before about alternative r rival hypotheses. So you have this difference and the IV came first but why else might the groups differ? And you got to figure out, well, what are the, all the possible explanations, and then try to eliminate uh, those, at least uh, make those explanations uh, less likely than the explanation that uh, your infinite variable uh, was the one that, that caused the difference. So, in theory, in an ideal uh, kind of people-free world where you did experiments with uh, robots, you could confidently establish internal validity by using uh, either of two basic designs either with two identical groups, right, so two groups who are exactly the same, and you treat them exactly the same, and then we uh, measure them on some variable after we've done something different uh, to one group than we do to another group, and we can be confident that those groups differ because of uh, what we did to them, right, because they're, they're identical. It's hard to find that. So, well, I'll get, I'll do pre-test, post-test. Because then it's the same, uh, uh, it's person uh, A, it's Ralph being compared to, uh, to at time one to Ralph at time two. And Susan at time one to Susan at time two, right? So you're comparing people to themselves. So there they are, they're identical, yeah. Well, more identical, yeah. But then you have your own set of problems and they're still not uh, identical, right? You say, well, they're not identical. Of course, they're not the same people. Well, uh, are you the same person now that you were uh, 10 years ago? And that's an extreme example, but it points to the fact that people change. You're a different person now than you were 10 years ago. You're a different person now than you were 10 hours ago. Right? You've experienced different things, thought of things, felt different things. You're not exactly the same person because you're at a different point in time and different things have happened. Um, so even with these uh, kind of idealized uh, groups, uh, and we can't have 100% confidence that we have internal validity. Right, with e-design because of several potential threats. Now we can take steps to reduce the influence of these threats, right? to maximize internal validity, internal validity, but you can never be 100% confident. And that's why uh, we talk about the impossibility of proof and disproof in behavioral science. Even if we find something, and we designed a really awesome study, very tight, very clean, uh, account for a lot of stuff, there's still a chance we could be wrong, and that even if there is a difference, that it might be due to something other than the independent variable. But we want to make that chance that it's not our independent variable as small as possible. And you do that by addressing uh, the threats to internal validity, which we'll talk about a couple of them here. Right. Uh, the ones that your, your, your book addresses. Uh, eight of them. So the first one is selection bias, right? which uh, exists when groups, you know, when we talk about groups, we're talking about um, groups of participants who receive different levels of the independent variable. Right? So uh, treatment group, no treatment group. Right? Uh, when the groups are different on the dependent variable before the independent, independent variable is introduced. Okay? That's selection bias. A uh, better term might be assignment bias, because really it's about deciding who will... Um, 
be assigned to different levels of the infinite variable. Who will receive what level of the infinite variable? Uh, not who will be selected into the study as a whole. When we're talking about that, who's going to be in the study, that's uh, sampling bias, which is something else which really has a greater impact on external validity than internal validity. Selection bias is, okay, we've got people in the study, who's going to be in which group? Right? Unless, of course, you select people into one group out of the population and then select uh, uh, from another population into the other group, which is uh, wrong. Okay. Um, so really we're talking about uh, assignment bias here. And uh, a couple things that can happen. Uh, probably one of the most egregious mistakes you can make would be to allow for self-selection. Let people pick uh, what uh, level of independent variable they want to receive. You just never do this, right? It, it, you lose all internal validity when this happens. So, you know, if you're doing a smoking cessation study, and you say, okay, uh, you want to be, uh, everybody who participates is going to get 100 bucks. Do you want to be in the treatment group, and we're going to give you treatment? Or do you want to be in the control group, where we don't give you treatment? Right. So I, I let people choose, I do my, my treatment, and I say, wow, look, a, people in my treatment group did much better in terms of quit smoking, more of them quit smoking than people in the control group. What's the problem with that? What's the alternative explanation for that difference? Well, people self-selected into the groups, so people who didn't really want to quit said, ah, I'll be in the control group, take my 100 bucks. People who were highly motivated to quit said, I'll do the treatment. Right, so even if the treatment didn't work, I might have still had differences in those groups, uh, even if they were even if they were maybe the same at time one. They all smoked the same amount. But if there's a difference, well, I, I, I'm smoking a lot, but I want to quit. You know, that person uh, six weeks from now is probably going to smoke less than somebody who smokes the same amount now and says, "Yeah, I don't. I love smoking. I'm never going to quit." Right? So we don't let people self-select into the levels of the independent variable into what group they're going to be in. Uh, the other thing we do is we don't use existing groups. Right. Um, uh, if you do, this, that's not an experiment. And you might think, well, I'll, I'll randomly sample uh, uh, um, from uh, some uh, population into the treatment condition, and then I'll randomly sample from another group uh, into the control condition. And you think, oh, that, well, that's great for generalizing your findings, but you have no internal validity. If you're randomly sampling from two different populations into two different groups, you've got pre, you've got potentially pre-existing uh, uh, differences. Uh, so the only way uh, to, to, or the, not the, only, the best way to deal with that is to use random assignment. And again, random assignment, random sampling, not the same thing. You can have a, a convenient sample. You, know, you get everybody in the class to be in your study, but then you randomly assign them to be in one uh, condition or the other. Right? Uh, unfortunately, random assignment is still not foolproof. We're, we still might end up with two groups that uh, are different before we introduce the independent variable. Right. Random assignment uh, distributes people uh, randomly, right, so that they should be roughly equivalent groups, but not necessarily because it's random. We can't random isn't uh, exact. It's it's <laughs> random, right? But the more studies that are done using random assignment that find an effect, the less likely it is that selection bias becomes a viable explanation for those group differences, right? And that's why we put such an emphasis on replication. Right? So we use random assignment to already say, okay, we're going to try to make these groups as equal as possible. We'll find something. And we say, well, we found something. We use random assignment. But the group still could have been different before we did anything. Somebody else do the study again. Somebody does the study again. They also use random assignment, making it really, uh, trying to make the groups as equal as possible. They find the same effect. It's pretty unlikely both of these groups happen to have kind of, uh, uh, you know, people who smoke less, happier people in the treatment group, in the control group, both times. And the more times you find that effect, the more confident you are that the effect is real, not due to uh, some sort of uh, uh, random difference or, or selection bias. Right? Um, then there's also uh, the uh, selection by maturation interaction, which uh, this happens when you don't use random assignment at the beginning. But maybe you somehow still manage to get equivalent groups, uh, at least equivalent on the dependent variable, before the IV was introduced. And probably by using a matching strategy. So you would uh, say, okay, well, uh, here's these uh, Girl Scouts and here's these Boy Scouts, and I'll uh, sample from each group until I get uh, equal IQ from each group, and then I'll do something different to the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts, and then see if they're different, right? And you say, well, they were the same at the beginning, because I, I measured them, I sampled them to be equivalent on the dependent variable. Right. A couple things. Uh, even if they're, uh, the group scored the same average uh, on the DV at the beginning, doesn't mean they're equivalent groups. They're not the same on all variables. You can't match them on all the potentially uh, influential variables. Right. Uh, 
and then but the the sele selection by maturation interaction says even beyond that even if they are uh, they look identical at one point in time they might not be later right so a difference that's, that isn't present or observable at one point in time when you do the matching might manifest itself that difference might manifest itself over time that's what maturation is so the groups might become more different uh, over time from when you did the matching to when you measure the DV after uh, you use the IV uh, and they might have looked different even if you hadn't introduced the independent variable right? I think it's something that's less likely to happen if you had uh, started with random assignment in the first place so don't use uh, existing groups and if you do use the existing groups uh, it's just some theoretical reason to do so you just have to know there's a good chance that uh, if you find a difference it may not be due to your independent variable and you've got to take steps to, to explain well here's why I think it is right and so they were the same on this variable this variable this variable and the only other reason they would be different is because of this but I measured that too or I, ma I manipulated that to keep that from happening right? so you create more work for yourself if you don't use random assignment so best plan use random assignment uh, okay uh, regression effects we're talking about regression to the mean uh, which is more of a problem for for pre post designs right uh, if you recruit people into your study based on extreme scores right so uh, I'm looking at a tr uh, depression treatment study so uh, you can only be in my study if you have really score really uh, high on measures of depression or really depressed uh, so I measure your depression now you're in a study yay and I'm gonna measure you in six months even if I didn't treat you your score is probably going to come down, right? It's going to regress to the mean. Because if I, all the people that are really, look really depressed, some of them may be really depressed. Some of them may not really be that depressed, right? Their true score might be lower than what uh, is measured because there's random error. We've talked about that before. Right? Um, but the random error, if it's extremely high, the random error probably didn't push their score down. They're probably not higher than that because this is the highest of the high. Right. So that means that uh, a good uh, portion of these people who are, are really who measured really depressed, looked really depressed, weren't that depressed. Their true score wasn't that depressed. So when I measure them uh, again later after doing my treatment, right, I can't expect random error to, to keep pushing their score in the same direction because it's random error. It might push it back the other way. It might push it below their average. So most of them probably will regress towards some average score and look less depressed even if I hadn't introduced my, my treatment, my independent variable. Um, and, and that's again for, for pre-post. If you use uh, kind of the two groups design, between groups design, uh, regression to mean not as big a deal as long as you still use random assignment. And both groups should, they should both regress to the mean if you use random assignment and they weren't, uh, um, they're not uh, sampled from different populations in the first place. Okay. Um, so more concerned with pre-post pre designs, uh, mortality uh, effects, which are also referred to as attrition. This is about people dropping out of your study and referred to as mortality because one way to drop out of study is to uh, die. Although usually that's not why we lose people. It's because they don't want to be in the study anymore. Right? Uh, and really it's more of a threat to internal validity if it's differential attrition, differential mor mortality. Because if equal numbers of people, uh, in, in if you have a true design, equal numbers drop out in each group, it's not that big a deal in terms of uh, does the, would that make these groups different? What makes the two groups different, not the IV, is if you have differential attrition. So if I have a treatment group and a control group, and I have a lot of people drop out of my uh, treatment group, and then I measure the people that are left, I say, wow, they all did really well. The treatment worked. Well, it worked for them. It probably didn't work for everybody that dropped out. Maybe that's why they dropped out. So maybe the treatment doesn't really work only worked for a, a small subset uh, of people right. um, so differential attrition uh, more of a problem when you have a, a, that two group uh, design uh, but uh, even if, if if you're doing a pre post obviously there isn't differential because it's the same people uh, but mortality can be a problem there to where from pre to post uh, so at the, at the pre scores were down here and the post everybody's doing really well but that's a problem if um, you're only looking at people who stayed in, the people who didn't do well, they dropped out of study because they weren't getting better. But you're concluding that treatment worked, eh, maybe not. Maybe it looks like it worked, again, because of uh, mortality. Uh, kind of similar to that would be maturation, which again is uh, affecting your pre-post designs. So when you have changes from pre to post are due to biological maturation, uh, which is more of a concern for longer running uh, longitudinal studies. We're probably not going to see 
mini maturation effects over six weeks as long as we're looking at uh, adults. You really want to worry about uh, maturation effects either when looking at uh, longitudinal studies or looking at uh, work with uh, adolescents, kids, or especially infants because the rate of maturation is uh, so much faster uh, at, at those stages than in adulthood. Again, we don't ever quit maturing and developing, but the rate of maturation does slow uh, in adulthood. Uh, history effects uh, might also be a problem. Again, more of a concern for pre-post designs in terms of a threat to internal validity. Uh, this is where something in the participants' environments has changed from pre to post other than the independent variable. Uh, for example, imagine you were uh, you uh, want to do a, a treatment study looking at uh, anxiety. So I uh, do a pre-post design, I measured people's anxiety, uh, I did a treatment, and then I measured the anxiety again. And unfortunately, I found uh, their anxiety went way up. Well, it could be that between my pre and my post, 9-11 uh, uh, happened and the towers fell and it, the collective anxiety of the nation increased, right? So I'll find a change in uh, uh, anxiety, an effect, you know, from pre to post, and I might mistakenly say my treatment caused people to be more anxious. Not necessarily. It might be something else out in the world. Um, and again, history effects can be major things like that, or they can be uh, minor ones. You know, if you're doing a study in a, some school looking at an intervention for uh, bullying, and you start at one point in time, and you're doing kind of a, a six-month study, uh, and pre to post you find bullying decreased, uh, but you didn't take into account that, oh, from when you measured time one and time two, uh, they stopped having pep rallies. And the kids that were getting bullied were getting bullied uh, before the pep rallies all the time. Right? So you have to be able to consider all the things that could affect the dependent variable that are going on outside in the world. Right. And it's really just a matter of paying attention to those. You can't stop the things from happening, but you have to notice them uh, and then address whether or not they would logically uh, affect the, the dependent variable uh, or not. Okay. Um, anyway, not much you can do to stop history other than uh, not do any kind of longitudinal pre-post design. Uh, testing effects. And when testing at time one has an effect on performance, uh, when, when testing again, uh, break down into a couple categories. Practice effects, whenever uh, they get better at whatever you're measuring. Uh, we have to talk about this whenever we're looking at uh, measures of uh, uh, kind of more performance related, like cognitive ability. How fast can you put a, push a button? How many uh, uh, letters can you remember? And maybe we're, we're teaching them some strategy to increase memory or increase learning. But the simple fact that they've had experience with this test uh, at time one. So the time one is kind of unfamiliar and they've never done it before. They should do better at time two, even if you didn't uh, do anything to them to help them get better. Right? Um, so one way to, to deal with that is to have a comparison group. So if you do pre-post, have pre-post with two groups. right? So uh, uh, then we can subtract out, basically, statistically, the practice effect uh, um, by saying people who didn't get our treatment whatever bump they got in performance, so they got this much better from pre to post, we're going to however much better they got, we'll subtract that uh, gain from the other people's scores and say, okay, whatever, if these people gained more than that, then our treatment had an effect. Okay. Uh, but there might also be fatigue effects in terms of uh, uh, taking a test again. The more, the more you test something, performance might go down. Might, uh, might decrease because they're getting tired of doing it. They're bored. This is stupid. I don't, I've done it before. I'm not going to do it again. And they pay less attention to their responses. Uh, and then you also have kind of a more informal category, the, the catching on effects. Um, this is where just measuring multiple times makes it harder to hide your hypothesis. And participants might figure out, you know, what the right way to respond is. So what I'm saying is we might be introducing demand characteristics uh, by measuring uh, multiple times, by, by testing. Um, so then they'll, they'll try to respond in line with what they think our hypothesis or hypotheses are. Uh, and then the last one is instrumentation, which is uh, that it is possible that you might uh, uh, measure the dependent variable differently at time one and time two. Usually something is done unintentionally, maybe because you really just want to see results so bad. Oh, that looks like I think it should be. Uh, but it, there may also be kind of practice or fatigue effects on the part of people who are doing the scoring. Assuming you some sort of uh, um, observation or where you're, maybe you're rating participants uh, and you get better at rating uh, how uh, aggressive or depressed or happy or whatever they are from uh, time one uh, to time two. Uh, to deal with this as much as possible, you know, you standardize your measurement and then you can also uh, go back and check. And really you can't check it. Well, you could, but it's not feasible to check every measurement for, for possible bias, but you kind of spot checks to see if uh, um, 
if the application of scoring criteria uh, were consistent uh, from time one uh, to time two. And this really only works if you have some, uh, some way to capture the behavior that was being measured. So if you videotaped uh, uh, time one and time two and somebody scored it live at the time, you go back and you pull uh, you know, 10 of the 100 observations and you say, okay, uh, see, look how they scored it at time one, look how they scored it at time two. Uh, did they apply the, the rules, the scoring rules, uh, the same way both times? Right? And the person making that decision doesn't know if it's time one or time two, which one they're looking at. Okay. And you kind of a spot check to see for instrumentation effects, uh, if you think it's a concern. Okay, um, okay. so summing up, uh, we've talked about eight threats uh, to internal ability, which are not all the threats. This isn't, this isn't by no means an exhaustive list. We've already mentioned a couple of others uh, elsewhere, uh, things like uh, things that threaten uh, your construct validity and how you're measuring your variables, uh, but also your, your data analysis strategies and the choices you make uh, there have an impact. Um, but these are uh, eight that are discussed uh, consistently throughout the literature. So they're important to, to know about. Uh, but what, you wanna, what I want you to do now is be thinking about uh, how the decisions uh, about formation of a sample affect internal validity. And a lot of the things we just talked about, those eight, a lot of them are related to sample and also to assigning people to conditions, which is a little bit more uh, other parts of the method. Uh, but think about that, but then also, don't forget about, because we'll be talking about uh, creating our sample, how do the choices we make in terms of uh, uh, recruiting, uh, selecting, creating a, a sample from a population, how do those influence external validity of our findings? Okay. All right. That's all for now. Take care.